we have the pleasure to have uh, Damien Gradato with us so from uh, CNRS et Observatoire de Paris who is going to talk to us about SCA trust in the era of data deluge so data deluge in the SCA context yes uh, hello everyone so um, uh, a, a very wide topic for me uh, for me today so so let me start with this disclaimer um, I have many questions uh, in, in my talk. I, I have few answers, but um, uh, it, it, it's mostly uh, food for thought. So uh, forgive me in advance if I don't address completely, uh, completely the topic. And as far as uh, questions, um, let, let, let's start with a, with, a, with a simple one. Are we alone in the, in the universe? So, okay, I, I said simple. I, I didn't say easy. Uh, so, so, so let's do a, let's do a quick experiment uh, with the the audience today. Uh, raising your hands, uh, who uh, thinks we think we are not alone in the universe? Okay, the vast majority uh, of you. And so, who think we are uh, indeed alone, the only living species? None. Okay, so <laughs> so you, you seem to be pretty sure that uh, that 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 we are not alone in the universe. So how can I trust you? Why should I trust you? You are scientists, right? You have do you have, do you have any proof, anything to, uh, to 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 make me trust you? You said to trust us. We gave you our opinion. We did no. not sign anything. So, you know, there is the funny, funny, funny part of it. So, you know, we we hate to think we are the best thing that uh, could be uh, could be living in this universe. We 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 can also uh, go a, a bit wider. Uh, try to to take a, a a bit more global approach to this and. Uh, Let's ask uh, ChatGPT. You know, uh, ChatGPT is, is building, you know, knowledge on the, everybody's knowledge or ev what everybody is sharing on the internet. And if you read ChatGPT, it's saying more or less the same thing as as you did today. Uh, it's very probable that uh, we are not alone, and there are other living species in the universe. But it's you know, it's still a question, and it's. Uh, um, uh, it, it remains one of the the, the great unknowns. So. What, uh, what, what, what can we learn from this? Um, and what are the ways we, we have usually to build trust? We, we can build trust in something if uh, we can explain it. You know, that's, that's the last point. Of course, this is the, the best way we, we can explain exactly why uh, something is or is not. We can reproduce it, so we, we don't know exactly the explanation, but we can do the experiment many times, and, and we have trust in the, in the result. Or we can just notice that this experiment is happening, uh, is, is redundant, is happening many times, uh, and the result is, uh, is trustable. So these are the, the three common ways uh, to build trust, and usually, as scientists, we try uh, to, to go through these uh, three steps uh, to, to make sure uh, that, that we have the, the correct reason. But here, uh, what, what you told me today, because you, you cannot explain, you cannot reproduce, you have no proof of redundancy of life in the universe, but you really have faith, right? So I'm, I'm a scientist. I, I'm not talking about God here. You, you have faith in, in, in something that is uh, very scientific. You have faith in statistical significance, right? Because <clears throat> well, in some sort of statistical significance, uh, there are about one billion stars in a, in a single galaxy, and uh, probably uh, ten or hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. We have discovered thousands of exoplanets around uh, neighboring stars, so really in our neighborhood, not even, you know, at the at, at, at the edge of our galaxy. So if you compare uh, the corresponding uh, probability uh, to uh, the probability to win uh, your million, you know, it's, it's significantly larger. 
and every week someone wins at your million, right? Even if the probability is very small. So here, what we are saying is that the chances that we are not alone are, uh, you know, uh, extremely large, and this is why you have faith in this uh, uh, in these numbers. So again, we cannot evidence life anywhere. Uh, we haven't been able to reproduce it neither, and of course we don't really know uh, what what life is uh, at the end. Okay, so uh, moving on uh, this this topic, first step to build trust, uh, finding new words, and that's what we astronomers uh, do. Uh, we are looking at stars and we are trying to detect uh, companions and evidence that these companions may be planets and look for the characteristics of these planets to know if they can host life uh, at the end and let, let me tell you about a, a, a result we published uh, back in uh, uh, 2009 about um, the direct imaging the, the discovery through direct imaging of what was at the time the youngest uh, exoplanet around the, around the star, around the star uh, Beta, Beta Pictoris. And you see here already, <laughs> uh, we, we had a problem with trust. Uh, the first paper we published was a probable giant planet around this, uh, this star. So wh wh why did we have this planet, so, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this problem with trust? Uh, this is the, the, the image uh, we, were, we were using at the time. Can you spot the planet around the star? Do you know where the planet is? Let me help you a bit. This is, this is a calibration star. There is one single planet. No? No. Here? Yeah, uh, you see there's a, a similar speckle here, so probably not uh, not a planet. Who knows? That was, was on the left. So this is how we obtain this result by comparing uh, the image from Beta Pictoris to uh, a calibration star and subtracting uh, in, in two different ways uh, the light from the calibration star um, from the light from, from Beta Pictoris. And we evidence the planet. To, okay, to build trust, um, uh, and if, if you go in the paper, you, you will notice this. To build trust, it, it, it took some time. The, the data we took dates back from uh, 2003. We published the paper in, in 2009. And what we had to do uh, uh, to build uh, trust on this result was to use data from the archive, both on Beta Pictoris and on uh, the calibration star, and uh, do some uh, image processing uh, totally independently. Uh, so two very different pipelines, people, uh, approach uh, to do this data processing, find the same result using um, uh, data from the archives, to make sure that we could publish this paper six years after uh, we did the observation. But the day we did the observation, I remember well, I was actually uh, at the time do doing the, the observation, we didn't notice anything. So access to archive data and the fact to be able to process uh, the data in two different independent streams uh, was critical. There, there is an appeal to this. Uh, later on, uh, the planet was observed uh, rotating around the stars, and we have we had clear evidence that the, the, the planet was was real. So, what is the takeaway message here? It all started with faith as well. Uh, we had evidence that there was going uh, there was something happening uh, in 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 the protoplanetary disk of uh, this, this star. So. There was indirect evidence and some form of explainability, even though we could not observe directly the planet. And building this uh, trustworthiness relied on access to archived raw data. So uh, there was the need for uh, archiving and saving, storing this raw data for a long time, long period, six years, and multiple independent data processing. So this reproducibility. And then building actual trust and 
publishing uh, the previous paper, the giant planet image in the disk, uh, required multiple observations, so redundancy uh, of, of the evidence. And this is exactly the classical pattern to build trust, so explainability, reproducibility, redundancy, plus, very important for us, it requires access to raw data and so its uh, preservation. Okay, so now that, that's for post-processing. That's, you know, the, the typical data analysis we do uh, in astronomy. What happens when we work in real time and when you need trust in a, a real time process? And I, I want to introduce you to this, uh, uh, to this concept we are using on, uh, on, on giant uh, optical telescopes that is called adaptive optics. And what we do with adaptive optics is to control in real time the shape of the incoming wavefront. The wavefront is um, uh, impacted uh, by uh, the, the crossing of the atmosphere, and the turbulence in the atmosphere is <coughs> sorry, disturbing the, the, the wavefront. And with adaptive optics, we compensate for these distortions to flatten the wavefront as much as we can and obtain this um, airy pattern I was, I was showing on, uh, you before on beta picture. So what we use to do that is uh, uh, at least one, sometimes several sensors that are cameras equipped with an optical device that will help us to encode in intensity uh, the waveform perturbation. This optical device can be a lenslet array, as, as I'm showing here, where we divide the pupil of the telescope in, in, in subregions and we analyze uh, the displacement in it each of these subregions. I will show you in the next slide another, another concept based on the parameter prism. And we use thousands of actuators underneath the, the reflective surface of a mirror to um, reshape the mirror to the actual shape of the wavefront, and so to flatten it as much as we can. The turbulence is evolving very fast, so we have to do this uh, in less than a millisecond. So every millisecond, we analyze tens of thousands of data points to produce thousands of actuator commands uh, to the deformable mirror. And as you can see here, this is a closed loop system. So stable time to solution is critical to maintain operation over, over, over. So that's for the general concept. And of course, uh, we control very expensive hardware here. So we really want to have trust in this real time controller in the way we uh, measure, interpret uh, the, the, the turbulence effect and uh, eventually control uh, the, the mirror surface. So uh, in, the, in, in planet hunting, uh, we use a very specific kind of sensor that, that, that is called the pyramid wavefront sensor. It's based on the, uh, on the Foucault's knife uh, principle uh, where basically with a pyramidal prism we create a discontinuity on the, on the optics and this will help us to increase our sensitivity but this creates a very non-linear optical element. It has a highly non-linear response. It's becoming a mainstream concept especially for planet hunting but of course since it's non-linear it's very difficult to use. So one thing we need to do is to linearize uh, the, the information coming from this, uh, from this sensor <coughs> to make it actionable. And the idea uh, we, 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 we have been pushing is to use a generative AI, so a UNET, uh, to provide nonlinear reconstruction. So here, what is very important to, to note is that uh, we are trying to uh, Determine to, to build an implicit model of a deterministic uh, phenomenon. We are not trying to solve, to, to, to measure uh, the, the, the turbulence, which is a stochastic process. We are trying to linearize the response from the sensor, which is fixed. You know, it's a prism with these uh, uh, discontinuities. And uh, we are trying to build an implicit model of a deterministic but highly nonlinear process, physical process. And <clears throat> the question is, of course, because we are using generative AI and this, this is going to be in the loop, uh, how do we build trust uh, uh, with this? Well, basically, we combine 
this uh, generative AI with uh, high performance linear algebra using <coughs> the classical model uh, uh, we, we use in adaptive optics, which is basically uh, the invert of the response matrix uh, of the, the, the wavefront sensor. Because the wavefront sensor is very nonlinear in this case, the accuracy of this linear reconstruction is limited. Basically, we reach saturation in, in most cases, but somehow it provides some, some boundaries. And we combine uh, this linear reconstruction, which is, you know, a classical approach with the UNET to provide an augmented version in terms of accuracy of the reconstructed waveform. And then we use uh, the result from this, uh, uh, from this process to feed uh, another neural network uh, that, uh, again, uh, is in fact a combination of a linear uh, plus uh, a linear control plus uh, control through reinforcement learning uh, to uh, feed back this information into the loop in a, in a predictive way. So, what is very important to note here is that to work with the stochastic process, we use a, a reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, we are directly interacting with the environment. We are trying to fit the actual distribution of the stochastic process as much as, as fine grained as we can uh, with this reinforcement learning. Uh, but if, uh, you know, whatever we do, is uh, out of bounds or totally uh, wrong, we will get this information from the reward that we have defined uh, for this agent. And uh, with the generative AI, we are just uh, looking into uh, this deterministic nonlinear model uh, of the, of the waveform sensor. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and what we get at the end is a stable and self-adapting uh, method to control this, this adaptive optic system. And I'm showing here the result for three very different um, uh, turbulence, turbulence conditions. So from very strong turbulence here to uh, relatively uh, rather mild uh, turbulence here. And uh, the red uh, result is what we obtain when we combine everything uh, including reinforcement learning uh, and uh, no linear plus nonlinear reconstruction of the wavefront sensor response. Uh, blue is without reinforcement learning, and, and violet here is the classical approach without any neural network. What is very important here is that we don't change the models. The, the, the model from the wavefront sensor is the same in all these cases, and reinforcement learning is constantly adapting. So. It's, it's really something that is self-adapting to the, the, the current regime of operation, and it's always providing the, 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 the best performance of the system as compared to, uh, to the classical method, even in very uh, favorable conditions. So, of course, the, the, the upper limit here is something we cannot reach because, again, we are fighting a stochastic process, and even if we are doing some sort of prediction, it's of course impossible uh, to predict uh, uh, with full accuracy the next iteration of a stochastic process. You can just guess uh, from the actual distribution uh, what, would be, uh, what would be the, the next step. So what is the takeaway message here? We try to build a universal uh, uh, non-leader reconstructor uh, by integrating the operational regime out of the problem here by building this model of the wavefront sensor and using reinforcement learning. Uh, this uh, unit, this generative AI does not work alone. We need to combine uh, this uh, with uh, both uh, the, 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 the linear reconstruction that will provide this bounce that we need. And uh, in fact, uh, it's, it's suboptimal in most cases if we use it alone. Uh, but it's optimal if we use it in combination with the, with the linear reconstruction. And so building trust here requires uh, the, the, the classical high performance computing uh, capacities that we have been um, uh, integrating in our instruments. And it, it's not, you know, a total paradigm shift where we go from, you know, uh, doing HPC in real time to doing just AI, but we want really to combine the two 
uh, to make something uh, trustworthy. And so trustworthy AI control needs redundancy with explicit models somehow in, in the loop. Okay, so uh, next part. Um, can we build trust on average? I was just mentioning a real-time application. So uh, when you are in a, in, in a in closed loop in real time, you need to have trust uh, on every uh, commands, uh, command you send to your uh, deformable optics. But it may be useful to build trust uh, on average. And I'm uh, mentioning here uh, another example, another tool in the uh, classical planet hunting gear, uh, which is data processing. So I was showing you before that to evidence the planet around Beta Pictoris, we needed an image of the calibration star and to subtract uh, the two to get the image of the planet. So exoplanet detections uh, requires reconstructing uh, images from the adaptive optics telemetry. Uh, so that you don't lose time uh, imaging uh, calibration stars. And another idea from, from my group was to use uh, image to image uh, translation. So the, you know, the, your, your favorite uh, uh, generative adversarial networks uh, uh, trained through supervised learning to do this task, going from uh, the wavefront sensor measurements to an image of the phase that we can translate into an image of the star uh, using uh, using a Fourier transform. So in this scheme, the the, the generator is uh, is still a unit, uh, the, more or less the same as in the previous example. But in this time, this time uh, we train it with a, a, a different uh, training process using uh, this uh, this this adversarial. Law. So you know this classical uh, deep fake images uh, or, or videos we are seeing propagating on the web today, and once uh, the network is trained, we are just using the generator to go from the wavefront sensor image to an actual image of, uh, of the star. So it's, uh, we, we are changing uh, space from the space of the wavefront sensor image to the space of the wavefront itself. And then Fourier transform, uh, we are going to the, the image space that, uh, that we need to reconstruct. And apparently, it works very well. Uh, and this is results we are obtaining on simulation. So here you see the ground truth. Here you see the predicted phase over a, a series of, uh, of, of images of, of the wavefront and the difference. And what you can notice on, 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 on this movie here is that the, the residuals, the error, is, is very fine grain. It's at, at very high uh, spatial frequencies. So it seems to indicate it's it's. So for the, the expert uh, eyes, uh, it, it, it's really fine grain. And it seems to indicate that our train network is doing some sort of super resolution. It's going beyond uh, the resolution of our sensor. And when you see that, it's, 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 it's fantastic. You know, it, I, I can use a very simple sensor, uh, you know, very cheap, make super resolution measurements of uh, the turbulence, and then uh, get, uh, get perfect correction. This will uh, divide the cost of an instrument that costs uh, tens of millions of euros by two or three, because the cost of the, the, the wavefront sensor is uh, at least half of the price of the, of the cost of the, the, the system. So it looks really nice. And if we look on average, if we try to reconstruct images uh, from uh, the, the, the output of the GAN, in fact, it seems to, to work uh, in real life. And, uh, 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 and this is a long exposure image uh, of, uh, of a star uh, obtained through simulation, but long exposure, so many, many uh, iterations of the adaptive optics loop. This is uh, the reference reconstruction we get from the usual model, uh, you know, the, the, let's say the, the, the classical uh, explicit model of, uh, of the data coming from the, the, the adaptive optics telemetry. And this is the inferred, uh, inferred solution uh, that we get out of the gap. And you see here, uh, our explicit model is suffering from a number of approximations. The first one being the, the very uh, symmetrical behavior we get at the output. And the GAN, the, the, the GAN output does not have this. You know? So 
really the the, the result they, they seem to be uh, to be to be really good looking and if you if you look at the error a circular circular average of the error uh, it seems to provide a lowered error exactly where you would expect to look for companions around the star you know rather close to the optical axis so rather close to uh, to the star so great you think okay here I have a method to increase my, my, my contrast very significantly, detect more exoplanets, and do it in a cheap way because my, my sensor can be uh, ve very simple to, to get exactly the same result. But then when, when you analyze the result, you realize that it's only working on average. And it's good for reconstructing images a posteriori, but it's definitely not good to uh, do something in, re in real time. If, if you look at the distribution of uh, the, the, the reconstructed uh, result uh, in terms of spatial frequencies, so basically it's the spectrum of the, the, the reconstructed error, uh, of the, 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 the reconstruction. And if, if you look at the variance, so you really build the spectrum of the, of the reconstruction and you compare this to the, the free turbulence that is in, in black, the true AO residual that is going to be in, in green here, and uh, what you obtain with a generative AI without adver adversarial loss, what I was showing you before, uh, with the pyramidal uh, prism, you notice that the blue is following very well uh, the distribution beyond uh, the cutoff frequency of the adaptive optic system. My super resolution I was mentioning before. So apparently, my network is able to infer something that it's not really measuring because my adaptive optic system is, is, is not able to produce information beyond this cutoff frequency. So when you look in variance on average, it seems to have very, very good properties. But now, if you build the variance of the instantaneous error Okay. If, if you build the variance of the instantaneous error of, of, of the network, you realize that, in fact, my GAN is doing something worse that, than doing nothing. You know? It's introducing an error instantaneously. So I cannot use it in the real-time system, because if I do that, it will create a number of artifacts trying to uh, you know, invent uh, something that is not the actual truth. It's a good representation of truth on average, but instantaneously, it's totally wrong. So the takeaway message from this, can we do science with deep fakes, with this, uh, this kind of, uh, of technology? Well, it, it really depends on, on what you want to do. If you want to analyze things on average, try to derive your distribution and do some um, uh, super resolution, but only on average, it may be good. But for most applications, where you need instantaneous truth on each sample of data, you need uh, you know a, a, a trustworthy uh, processing of it, somehow interpretation of it. It's 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 not really usable uh, to to do science. Okay, so now is the time I'm I'm talking about SKA uh, and the era of data deluge. So. Of course, we, we, today we are building uh, these adaptive optic systems. Um, we are increasing the amount of data we receive from the system. We are integrating um, uh, neural networks in them, in them. And we are finding ways to do that. But uh, the, the main takeaway message in, is that in all these applications, we can preserve raw data for a very long time because the data volumes are not uh, that, that, that big. SKA is a totally different story. So it's one observatory, two telescopes, uh, one in, in Australia, uh, one in, uh, in South Africa, plus headquarters in the UK, so over three continents. Our goal is to distribute uh, data globally, uh, again, so from the two sides plus headquarters. But uh, Canada, India, China are uh, the members of, of the consortium. And here is the typical architecture uh, of, the, of, the, of, of, oops, sorry, of the observatory. Uh, the uh, one telescope, so one group of antennas or, or parabolas, will produce over 10 terabits per second of data continuously, 
24-7 that need to be reduced, uh, uh, converged, and processed to build these observatory data products on site, so within the host country, before they can be distributed worldwide to what we call the, 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 the regional centers. So we are really going into a new dimension, 10 terabit per second, 24-7. Uh, and of course, uh, we need to have trust in uh, whatever processing we are doing. So we tend to decompose this in, in, into two domains. We have the edge to HPC, where we collect, converge, and reduce data streams uh, from the distributed center, uh, uh, sensors. And again, reduce this continuous 10 terabit per second stream uh, of raw data to about 350 petabytes per year. And this is what is distributed worldwide. And of course, we are a scientific community with you know, limited budget somehow. So this should be affordable, of course. We are scientists, so we always have new ideas. So it should be adaptable. Uh, we are living in a, in, in a world where you know access to energy uh, is difficult. It's it's pricey and it, it may be detrimental to the ecosystem. So it should be frugal, and it should operate 24/7. So it should be resilient. Okay. So we have to build these machines uh, that are just crazy with limited budget, and they should work uh, with no impact on the environment. Then we go to the the other domain, which is the HPC to cloud, where we distribute this data globally and uh, this data will uh, will be sent to users community that may be distributed and we have a number of other topics around this uh, resource federation increasing the use of AI still with a uh, you know trustworthiness uh, problems of access patterns provenance um, resource accounting etc uh, in in this other domain so there are multiple challenges, and again, I don't have uh, solutions to uh, to all of them. But let me let let, let me focus on, uh, on on few of them. First challenge: the pipeline complexity. So what I'm showing here is the typical pipeline uh, we use to reduce data on the in the host country. So this is almost directly behind uh, the antennas. We produce so it's an interferometer. So uh, we produce what we call visibilities which we obtain from the combination of um, uh, signals from uh, pairs of antennas. And then it goes through uh, this, uh, this pipeline, which is iterative, uh, that have uh, one uh, minor, uh, minor loops and major loops. Uh, and we are accumulating data uh, continuously in real time. So it's, it's a complex iterative pipeline and uh, program and condition dependent. Why is it program and condition dependent? Because uh, to cover as much as we can of the uh, uh, UV um, uh, plane, uh, we use uh, the Earth rotation during the observation. One observation which will last several hours. The Earth will rotate uh, during this time. And of course, the projection of the distance between two antennas uh, will change depending on the orientation, uh, so depending on the, on, on, on the Earth rotation. And by doing that, we can cover a larger um, area within the UV space, so augment uh, the, the quality of the reconstruction. But of course, this will augment as well uh, the amount of data we are we, we are capturing. It's also condition dependent because our uh, so it's called the, the square kilometer array. But what is a square kilometer is the the, the, the surface of, of metal we are using to detect things. But the antennas, uh, they are distributed over hundreds of kilometers square. And so, of course, the, this distance means that the projected distance in the sky will cross regions of the ionosphere that are highly inhomogeneous. And depending on uh, the, the time of observation, depending on the pairs of antenna you are considering, uh, the uh, ionospheric irregularity will, will change and will impact the data. So we have to take this into account in our pipeline. So we have a complex iterative pipeline program and condition dependent. How do we build trust in the way we process this data? Because 
we will lose access to raw data at the end. Okay, 10, uh, 350 petabytes of data per year. This is reduced data, but we have no means available to store a continuous stream of 10 terabits per second uh, over you know, several years. We will lose access to raw data, but still we need to have trust in the way we reduce uh, 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 this raw data. Challenge number two, we are looking at the unknown. We build this uh, telescope because there are many unknowns and we are trying to address uh, a, a new discovery space in, uh, in, in physics, in astronomy and in cosmology. We don't know what we are uh, looking for, to be honest, and we don't have a reference. So if we detect something unusual, uh, is it really real or is it an artifact from uh, whatever processing we are doing on the data? So how do we build trust in a context where we are looking for the unknown? Challenge number three, a paradigm shift. So again, no preservation of raw data. We are in a data flow operational model. And the only thing we can uh, afford today is to build this very large buffer, which will contain only 24 hours of uh, observation in terms of raw data. And we have to uh, make sure uh, the telescope remains operational 24-7 if we want to uh, you know, maximize the, uh, the efficiency, the, <clears throat> the value for money that we, uh, that we put in this experiment. Uh, so we are really in a new model, we're in a new operational model where we cannot store raw data. We don't have a reference point. We don't know exactly what we are observing. And we need to build trust on uh, the way we process uh, the data that will be stored into this, uh, this, this very large buffer. Challenge number three, uh, other, uh, another paradigm uh, shift. Uh, you probably know that uh, uh, we have a few uh, billionaires today that, are, that, that found a, a very good idea to send thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit to cover and provide a high bandwidth uh, uh, internet to uh, anyone on Earth, even people that uh, don't really uh, want or need uh, need this, and we have to cope with this. Okay, we have to cope with this new class of radio interference, where we have these constellations of uh, uh, useless satellites around us, and uh, we have to find smarter way smarter ways to mitigate uh, these these interferences. And this is where typically you want to put AI, right? You have this highly variable constellation. You cannot really predict uh, the impact. You cannot build an explicit model to mitigate the effect of this. So this is typically where you want to, uh, to, to, to plug AI to, you know, denoise, the filter, remove this interference. But again, uh, once you process the data, you know, that's, that's the last time you will have uh, this data at hand. You, you, you cannot store uh, raw data. So how do we cope with this new uh, uh, changing, uh, changing environment? And challenge number four, sustainability. Uh, so we are uh, building a very large experiment. We have a, a lot of challenges. We have limited budget. Uh, we have limited means uh, to do all of this. Uh, but uh, and, 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 and we are trying to innovate in the uh, you know, development model for this experiment. Uh, so we want to uh, you know, find the right trade-off between these different dimensions uh, of sustainability. Uh, we, uh, our goal with such an experiment is to enhance access to affordable services and knowledge. Uh, we have a responsibility uh, to be environmental, as environmentally friendly as possible. Uh, so being very energy efficient, uh, of course. And um, again, very limited budget. Uh, and uh, we have to find ways uh, to uh, base all this development on joint public-private uh, collaborations and develop as much as we can sovereign technologies so that the telescope remains operable even if you know the supply chain uh, may, may may be impacted 
So how do we build trust uh, with these multiple challenges? Again, looking for the unknown. So no explainability of what, uh, what, what we'll be observing. Change of paradigm, no reproducibility. We are in a very different context than uh, we have ever been before. And sustainability. Uh, we need to be frugal so we have less room for redundancy. And uh, building trust is uh, critical uh, for the, the, the societal impact. So we need new, new strategies. And we are working on it. So I don't have a solution for all of these challenges, as, as I told you. Um, but uh, we may come up with ways to introduce some form of redundancy uh, in, in what we are doing, which is, again, the first step uh, to, to build trust. Uh, but try, trying to make it as, as frugal a, 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 as possible. And I wanted to, um, um, to focus uh, on, on, on this kind of work we have been doing um, so, so, so in, um, in linear algebra in general that can be used uh, in, in many domains, not only in, um, in, uh, in, in astronomy. Uh, and uh, where when you have to handle very large matrices or you know very large corpus of data, uh, you have to ask yourself if you can focus more on the information content that you have in your data rather than on the actual data content. This can come from several reasons. Um, in, in, in many uh, operational settings, uh, you have a lot of redundancy in your data. The, uh, information is replicated many times because of the architecture of uh, uh, your operational setting. You have noise, and noise is a threshold under which you lose access to actionable data, uh, to actionable information, sorry. So in many ways, it's, it's possible to um, find ways to uh, leverage sparsity. Uh, that can be because there is no data, of course, but that can also be because um, uh, you have redundancy or the presence of noise. And this can be done through, uh, through algorithm uh, redesign and can be, uh, can be uh, very efficient. And so we, we have this paper that uh, uh, we, we, we wrote uh, celebrating the, uh, the uh, a Turing Prize uh, last year uh, about uh, using um, uh, reduced uh, precision in the representation of numbers and how can we leverage that into uh, into linear algebra and there are many ways to do that you can uh, uh, cherry pick the resolution you will use in uh, blocks of uh, matrices uh, that's the let's say cautious and responsible but you can also even go beyond that and try to compress data in some blocks so use uh, full blocks with reduced precision, but you can also remove by compression uh, a certain amount of data in, in some blocks of your matrices to save space and, uh, and be more, more frugal. And adaptive optics is one example where we can do that, but okay, I'm showing that, but again, you can do that in, in, in many different domains. Uh, where you see here the, the typical control matrix for an. Uh, so it's, it's a small portion of the typical uh, control matrix for the adaptive optic system. And, and what you see here very obviously is the redundancy uh, in, in this representation. So this is the full dense matrix that we use to control uh, the adaptive optic system uh, with the uh, classical approach. And uh, you can see here that there is room for compression, of course. There is room to be more frugal. You probably don't need to use all these numbers uh, to do exactly the same, the same thing. And this goes through an analysis of the kind of uh, accuracy threshold you can define depending on your tile size um, compared to uh, the typical uh, performance of your system after compression. And you can find uh, your sweet spot by exploring this, this parameter uh, uh, space. And we found out that we can uh, reduce uh, the, the amount of data by a factor of four. Uh, this is clearly not negligible. So imagine your 10 terabit per second data stream not transformed into two terabits or 2.5 terabits per second. 
you have already uh, you know uh, gone to, uh, to 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 step two. Another way to do that is to build uh, stochastic approaches of um, uh, cl classical methods. Here I'm showing another example coming from adaptive optics uh, systems where we are trying to fit on uh, actual uh, adaptive optics telemetry um, uh, the uh, parameters uh, that describe uh, the, the, the statistics of uh, the, the atmospheric turbulence. And here again, in, in, in this uh, covariance matrix that we are showing here, there is a lot of redundancy. So the classical method is to use this uh, Levenberg. There, there are many methods, but here you can use, for instance, uh, uh, levenberg markard uh, optimization uh, uh, to find your, your, your ideal parameters. If you use the classical way, you will use the, the dense matrix and just you know, uh, minimize your, your criterion. We have shown in this paper that, in fact, you can pick a number of elements randomly uh, within the, the two matrices and do exactly the same levenberg markard optimization and get to the exact same accuracy but in, in much much faster, of course, because you are using way less uh, data to do the job. And to, to get to the same accuracy uh, when it, it was taking about uh, eight seconds before, now it, 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 it can take up to, uh, to a, few, um, a few tens of milliseconds uh, by using a, a very low number of, of elements. I think uh, uh, one thousandth of, uh, of the elements of the, of the matrix in this case. So, uh, takeaway message, and I think, yes, that's my final word. Uh, we are entering this era of data deluge. We will produce uh, so much data uh, that we cannot store this data anymore. We, we need to build trust in real time as we process this raw data. We are facing this paradigm shift toward this data flow driven operational model this is instantaneous trust and because of this sustainability considerations we have less room for redundancy we know we need to couple uh, you know new methodologies like deep neural networks with classical approaches this introduces redundancy uh, but of course this comes at, at a cost and we have a limited room for that uh, so HPC still has a critical role to play in our experiments, but uh, frugality is a key aspect. And because we understand very well these explicit models, we can do um, algorithmic redesign very efficiently uh, in the classical models and try to introduce that in our uh, deep neural networks approach uh, by focusing on information content rather than on uh, data. And I just wanted to mention uh, two, two supporting initiatives uh, uh, for, for this work. Uh, I'm the director of ECLA, um, uh, which is a consortium between CNRS, INRIA, l'Observatoire de Paris, l'Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur, and EVIDEN, uh, 15 labs and teams working together, 45 people. So quite an exciting endeavor. And one of the uh, large projects that is supporting us in some activities is NumPex, and uh, you have uh, Julien in the room that uh, does very well the, the, the project. And uh, it's, it's one of our, uh, of our key projects uh, today. And that's it for me for today. There are some questions. Yes, Yoshi. Hello, for the your gun produce some sort of um, physical spectral you said and uh, if you replace GAN with your conventional uh, image generator model like stable diffusion what do you like to expect you expect much more worse result or more reasonable result so <clears throat> so I think uh, so, so we, we we wanted to uh, we wanted to exploit uh, a feature of image to image translation, which is to extrapolate, to invent information that is beyond our reach because our operational is, setting is limited. 
And what, what we found out is that um, you, you cannot do that by, um, if, if you have a perfectly linear sensor that has a cutoff frequency, everything that you will guess after that, um, after this cutoff frequency, uh, does not exist in the data. And what you are trying to infer is the, 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 the next sample in, in, in a stochastic process. And if you think about the definition of what is a stochastic process, you will understand very quickly that, in fact, it's impossible. A GAN or you know, whatever neural network cannot infer very accurately the next iteration of a stochastic process. It's random. It's stochastic. So the, what you can do at best is fit the distribution and try to guess with limited precision of what would be the distribution of the next uh, thousand iterations, right? But the next one you cannot get with perfect accuracy. That's the definition of a random process. And in fact, we started all this work without thinking about this very fundamental fact that, uh, you know, in, in this case, we were using a very linear sensor. There, there was no nonlinear uh, features to be exploited from the response of the sensor. So our neural networks are just fitting distributions, which are the signatures of the operational regime we are, we are under. And there is no point of trying to extrapolate the next iteration, uh, the instantaneous. There is a point to do that on average, but not instantaneous. And, and, and this, you know, I, I, I haven't tried every possible, you know, uh, AI methodology to do that. But the, if, if I believe the fundamental principle that the next iteration is random, uh, I should convince myself that there is no way to predict it with enough accuracy to be, to be useful. This is very different from what we do with the, the pyramid wavefront sensor before. And I, I was trying to insist on that here. Whoops. Here, we are not trying to infer a stochastic process. We are trying to build a deterministic model of a nonlinear phenomenon. So, so it's a physical process where we can build a number of equations to have an explicit model of the sensor. And I can reproduce uh, what my sensor is doing. What I cannot do is invert this explicit model because it's too complicated. There are too many parameters and it's nonlinear. So I don't know how to solve the inverse of this equation. So I use a network, so in this case it's a unit, uh, to build an implicit inverse model of this deterministic nonlinear process. This I can do, and here I can extrapolate because this is deterministic. So, uh, if I have one input, I have one output. You know, there is no probability in between. Um, I have another question about the uh, the matrix. And you you presented last you said few minutes, and uh, I'm wondering, and uh, what is the difference between just using this sparse matrix representation and your raw precision matrix representation? Uh, oh, sorry, it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this one? Yeah. So we yes. also have the, uh, the conventional CSR or some sort of the sparse matrix representation, and you present something like the mixed precision matrix representation. Yes, yes. Well, in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's compression. So uh, we are we are removing some data. It's, it's not just mixed precision here. It's compression. It's mixed precision on compression. But uh, I didn't have time to, to go through it. So wh what we do basically is that we analyze the, so we, <clears throat> we have the classical linear algebra that, uh, so it's a, uh, it ends up with, a, if you will, a matrix vector multiplication. So we have our input vector. We multiply it by this matrix. We get an output. And this output is used to control the, the system. We have, uh, so from this, uh, we get our uh, reference solution. So, so we know with this dense linear algebra method, uh, 
uh, what, what will be our performance at the end. Then we start to compress and use mixed precision on the compressed data. And we redo the exact, the, the exact same experiment. So we have redesigned the matrix vector to work on compressed data uh, to inject mixed precision. And we do the matrix vector multiplication, put it in a system, get the final performance. Uh, we do that for many accuracy threshold and many tile sizes. And we measure the performance. So our uh, so the reference performance is 16% uh, turbulence compensation. And if we go below 12%, you know, it's, it's not acceptable anymore. And we do this experiment for many different parameters before finding the sweet spot where we get maximum compression rate with comparable performance. But again, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's an iterative process. It's a, it's a dichotomy, if you will. Uh, but since, uh, you know, this redundancy depends on the operational setting, on the redundancy inside our instrument, the way we have uh, designed the, the different sensors, uh, this compression factor is uh, the one we can use for the whole lifetime of the instrument after that. So this experiment, we just do it once and use it for 10 years after that. Um, so I noticed you are using uh, for your performance figures uh, 800 and ICX, so Intel uh, hardware based, I guess. Uh, I don't see any FPGA. And another question would be uh, Are you thinking about making a pipeline like they are doing at CERN, where they have a few terabytes per second of data coming in and doing some triggers with uh, ML inference and then just keeping a few terabyte on the side of the... Yes, I mean, so no FPGA, uh, yes, correct. Uh, it's um, the, at, at this stage, the development cycle on FPGA is probably too expensive for the kind of experiments we do. Since we are, tra since we are trying to find the right trade-off between accuracy and, you know, amount mm. of data, etc. But once this is fixed, it may be interesting to go to an FPGA implementation to optimize, you know, the energy footprint, for instance, or the response. Mm -hmm. So, but at this stage, you know, not really, uh, it's too costly okay. for, for, for the purpose. And then second, yes, so <coughs> the, 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 the question is, uh, what, what is the level of acceptability by the community? Because the community is investing a lot to build the instrument. They are already very worried that they will not get access to raw data. So mm -hmm. if on top of this, you tell them, uh, I did put a neural network here to trigger uh, things, and I will send you this data only if the neural network says it was interesting. Some people would say, yes, great. Uh, and some other will say, no way. And you know, that's the, that's the problem. How, how, so. Trust, trust is a matter of acceptability at the end, you know, because you know, real full trust is you know, probably a very abstract uh, concept. Now, what, what, how people can accept that we put uh, this kind of technologies untested into an instrument that costs so much to the community is uh, the the, the trade-off I would see is how much of the raw data, if you just have raw data is going to be actually used in the foreseeable future, like 10 years, 20 years. And how much, if you just do triggers, is actually going to be used? And what's the difference? Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's exactly the, the right trade-off to do. And, uh, and that's how we are approaching it. Um, there are programs like, you know, uh, mostly cosmological programs where people need to accumulate, you know, con large quantities of data and uh, that the processing is extremely uh, sensitive to many things at the end. They will probably want to access raw data and uh, a good fraction of them, uh, even if, you know, this takes 10 years to accumulate, they will prefer, you know, uh, capturing raw data. 
Now, if you are looking for, I don't know, uh, exoplanets around stars or whatever, uh, this is a very fast program, and you can and and you are going to you are going to do a survey basically. You are going to observe uh, you know hundreds or thousands of of different targets, and this is where a, a trigger makes sense. You know, like okay, if you miss one. You know, maybe yeah, this, this is not you know, this is not a problem. So this is highly dependent on the science program you are executing at the end. Questions? Maybe two so I, I was I have a question about um, the problem models. So I imagine you have a lot of different computers with many different technologies. Like you, if there is no homogeneous uh, hardware you would use on. So this, this comp uh, so for adaptive optics, uh, we are mostly using GPUs today uh, because to do this kind of memory-bound linear algebra plus AI, you know, this, this is the good tool. So this is rather solid, and you, you, we have a platform, and we can, and we are building new new systems with that, and this is pretty robust. For SKA, that's that's a different story. Uh, that's the first time we build such an experiment. There are existing radio telescopes, but they work in a totally different way. Today, the data are stored on hard drives and shipped, like in a ship, <laughs> <you know? laughs> uh, through the oceans uh, to the users, and, and, and then you know they, they, they can work on raw data. Now we are building something very new, where we are in a data flow model, and we, and so we are inventing this new computer. And you know, one option is to be very heterogeneous, and you know. Uh, with this architecture I was showing here. Uh, so you see the, the antenna, we have uh, some sort of aggregator where we will converge data, so maybe FPGAs here are very good. Um, here we have uh, ingest, uh, which means uh, data transport, but this data transport may be intelligent, so you may want to process and compress data as they go through the wire. Uh, so FPGA or smart interconnects. Uh, then you have storage, but you may want to have some uh, uh, in, in, in storage computing somehow to again compress even more the data and increase the size of your buffer for batch processing. There may be uh, you know different technologies. We are designing this, and there are many questions. And yeah, programming model is a is is, is a good question here because if we are very heterogeneous. It's good for hardware because we, you know, we, we, we take the best of whatever is technology is available. But of course, for the programmer, it's way simpler if the programming model is uh, unified across all these technologies. But there is still a big question mark here. And even, you know, this is uh, old design, and we are trying to redesign the, 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 the whole computer today. J'ai une question. Du coup, tu parlais de durabilité tout à l'heure, enfin d'environnement. Okay. Est-ce que la, la, la question, c'est la durabilité de tout système Au combien d'années vous, vous comptez Parce que est-ce que vous comptez le mettre en place pour 5 ans Ça sera obsolète dans 5 ans, pour 10 ans Et ben, l'amortissement du coût CO2 de l'installation Très bien réfléchi à ça. Euh, alors, moi, personnellement, un petit peu. D'autres pers personnes se sont posées beaucoup plus de questions sur le sujet. Euh, je pense qu'il n'y a pas une réponse définitive. Ce qui est sûr, c'est que si on suit le modèle des autres grandes infrastructures pour l'astronomie, le système ne va pas être construit pour 5 ans, mais probablement des dizaines d'années. Et il euh, y a sur la, le plan de construction du SK, il y a une période qu'ils appellent « refresher », où on va essayer de mettre à jour une partie du matériel, mais faire ça de la manière la plus... Euh, raisonnable possible, notamment du fait de l'empreinte carbone, euh, des composants. L'idée, c'est d'essayer euh, de, de trouver le meilleur. Nous, en tout cas, alors, un petit peu d'historique aussi, la France rentre dans euh, l'organisation SKA un peu plus tard que d'autres nations. Il nous a fallu du temps pour convaincre euh, nos autorités locales de <rire> nous soutenir. Mais en tout cas, le message que, que, que tu viens de passer, c'est celui que la France essaye de passer aujourd'hui. C'est euh, Si on regarde l'empreinte carbone globale, c est, c est, c est un, ça va être un gros problème. Euh, donc, on veut construire, on veut co-designer une solution qui soit la plus frugale possible en tenant compte de tout le cycle de vie euh, de, de, de l'instrument et pas seulement le fonctionnement. 
aujourd'hui, euh, ce message-là, il n'est pas complètement passé. Par contre, le message du coût carbone du fonctionnement, il est bien passé, parce que, que ce soit en Australie, en Afrique du Sud, la production d'énergie, elle est très, très carbonée, voire totalement carbonée. Euh, et en plus, dans des pays comme l'Afrique du Sud, elle n'est pas du tout garantie. C'est-à-dire que dans certaines régions d'Afrique du Sud aujourd'hui, il y a des coupures de courant pendant la moitié de la journée. Donc, ça veut dire que nous, pendant 12 heures, on ne fait rien tous les jours. Euh, et ça, ce n'est pas acceptable pour, pour ça. Donc, il euh, y, y a tout un travail qui a déjà été fait en amont pour qu'au moins la fourniture d'énergie, on ait des stratégies qui soient euh, bien identifiées au sein de l'observatoire et qui soient la plus décarbonée possible. Maintenant, moi, euh, ce message de prendre en compte tout le cycle de vie, euh, je suis complètement d'accord. Euh, et le modèle de data flow qu'on qu défend ici, qui est de dire, euh, j'arrête le modèle actuel de tout mettre sur des disques durs que j'envoie par avion ou par bateau euh, à mes collaborateurs à gauche et à droite, mais d'utiliser les infrastructures pour transférer les données, c'est aussi une manière d'optimiser euh, l'empreinte carbone ou l'empreinte environnementale de tout le site euh, tout au long de son cycle de vie. Donc c'est une autre mesure. Mais il y en a plein à prendre. Quoi. Et la, la solution, elle n'est pas, pas triviale. Quoi. Je suis bien d'accord. <rire> Julien, tu avais peut-être une... Ouais, je ne sais pas, niveau timing, si j'ai le temps. Euh, bon, allez, aussi, rapidement, aussi en discutant. Non, basically, I was wondering, so like the, this is an extremely ambitious workflow. Uh, you have the ability to, to, to use like supercomputers, uh, cloud data centers, and to be one of the first, maybe, uh, example of a workflow that goes from sensor to, to, to data center to a computing center. Uh, so, yeah, this looks extremely challenging. I am wondering where from are you starting? Like uh, the current uh, radio telescope, what kind of uh, computing infrastructure do you use today? Uh, ancient. <laughs> Uh, if we look at the LOFAR, uh, LOFAR telescope, which is uh, uh, a, a continent, continental scale radio inter interferometer that we, are in, in, that we have in Europe, there is no data flow model. So the data are uh, stored on site. So the good thing about uh, radio astronomy is that you, you can store both the amplitude and the phase uh, of your light wave. So it means you can recombine uh, a posteriori which is not the case, for instance, with optical interferometry. And so the radio astronomy community have been using that uh, for the past uh, 50 years or 60 years. They store data on site, transport uh, hard drives to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, whatever, not super, but big computer they would have available and start processing data on this computer a posteriori. And So far, we store a lot of data, but we are not able to actually process uh, the, the largest surveys. And what they use for LOFAR, it's mostly uh, CPU-based uh, clusters. Uh, I could not tell you the number, but it's a few tens of server max. So there, so there, there is a... Dedicated clusters for it, this use case, you don't rely for now on shared infrastructure? There like is one for LOFAR, but very limited. Uh, and now the users community, they will rather get the raw data and use a regional or national facility. But again, with the technologies, uh, I mean, the, the code base is not ready for the newest technologies and be the, the most efficient. Thank you. So we start from far. <laughs> <laughs> Thank again, uh, Damien. About